afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. And no, I am not Paul, and no, I am not Charles, but this is your future in just two short years. So I am the president-elect nominee. I'm excited to be here today, and that means I'll be starting my presidency again in 2024, in July. So it'll be quite some time, but here we are practicing today to make sure I know what I'm doing. Although many of you probably say I do not know what I'm doing. I will be fill <laughs> Somebody, it looks like Alex. Fr friends everywhere. I just remember the one time my birthday came up and you all booed me, but thank you. Yes, but thank you for joining us today. We have a wonderful, wonderful speaker. We are very, very excited. Uh, today, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our great friend, Greg Zekarski from Cyber Nine, Zakarski. See, I'm already messing it up, as tradition is to mess up names. Greg Zakarski, who we actually do know each other well, I should know his last name, from Cyber Nines, is he our sponsor for today's event. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Greg. As we always do, we're going to open our meeting with reciting the four way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, and please remain standing. We've got our great friend, Robert Reed, who will lead us in My Country, Tis of Thee, with Elaine Mishler on the keyboard. Welcome, Robert. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land where the pilgrims pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Before we begin the meeting today, somebody did leave a cell phone, a cell phone uh, at the front. It's an iPhone, so we will have it over near uh, Jane and the team's desk. So there is one left cell phone. All right, we're very excited to bring up Ron Luskin, who's going to go over all of our guests here today. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to announce uh, our many guests that are here today. For those of you who are guests, uh, I'll be calling your name. Please rise, and then we'll recognize you all at uh, the conclusion of the introductions. So first off, um, a guest of Greg Zakarski, we have Scott Singer. And then Haitham Aldahari is a guest of the Veterans Fellowship Group. Rabbi Betsy Forrester of Beth Israel Center is a guest of Scott Forrester. Beth Larson is a guest of Valerie Rank. Creighton Kinto is a guest of Ashley Kinto Powell. Nan Zimdars, uh, guest of... Um, Mike Hosley, Hank Whipple, guest of Carol Toussaint, Gloria Reyes, guest of Wendy Melendez, <laughs> Margaret Pearson, guest of Becky Steinhoff, and Margaret is here with us from Lebanon, Illinois. Thank you very much and welcome. Well, I guess I have better notes than Ron because my notes do say that we should give an extra special welcome. Please stand up again to Dave Anderson, who is the district governor for 6220. And they are one of the uh, districts that are going to be part of the Tricon Conference here coming up in La Crosse. So welcome, Dave, to our club. We're glad to have you. Thank you for your service to Rotary. All right, next up, I'm going to introduce members to the nominees for the Madison Rotary Foundation Board of Trustees. This year's nominees for four-year terms on the Madison Rotary Foundation Board of Trustees beginning July 1st are, please stand if you're here today, Dee Flurry Simmons, Tammy Thayer, and Mark Westover. 
So thank you. Yes, thank you for stepping up for your service. We really appreciate it. The election of new trustees will take place at the annual meeting of the Madison Rotary Foundation just before our regular Rotary Luncheon on Wednesday, March 8th. As, as prescribed by the foundation bylaws, any 10 members of Madison Rotary can submit in writing, signed by those said 10 members, any additional names or names of the uh, foundation secretary to Pat Jenkins and sent to our Rotary office for their inclusion on the ballot. All names must be submitted by March 1st and shall be included on the ballot by March 1st, if you're interested. Let's thank D. Tammy and Mark for their willingness to serve on the Foundation's Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. All right, next up, it is my honor to bring up a friend of mine, Alan Ebert, headed of this year's Veterans Assistance Committee. He's going to come up and tell us about the grants being distributed from this year's fund. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, Mr. President-elect. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I am happy to be up here to tell you about um, this wonderful uh, grant assistance committee that we have as part of Rotary. Um, as Jason said, I'm Alan Ebert. I chaired the meeting this year to review applications submitted to our Veterans Grant Assistance Committee. First, a little bit of background. Um, in 2013, Phil and Kit Blake made a $100,000 gift to establish a Veterans Grant Assistant Endowment Fund within our Madison Rotary Foundation. George and Andrea Hidalgo added $105,000 over the past two years um, in honor of their son, U.S. Army First Lieutenant Darren Hidalgo, who was killed in action in 2011 while serving his country in Afghanistan. The interest on this fund is providing grants to veterans who have been honorably discharged from active duty and who have transitioned to full-time college, either at Madison College, Edgewood College, or UW-Madison. As we all know, attending college is a challenge and there can be some unanticipated expenses and emergencies that come up. This is why the fund was set up, specifically to help veterans get through these tough times. This year, our committee reviewed 12 applications and grants totaling nearly $9,000 were awarded to seven veterans. These grants helped provide much needed housing repairs, medical bills, childcare expenses, um, and rent and utility for these veterans. The grants helped ease their mind so that they could stay focused on their studies. We sincerely thank Phil and Kit Blake and George and Andrea Hidalgo for their generosity in making these meaningful grants possible for veterans in our community. And I hope that we all will consider donating to this fund and keep, keep growing this fund so we can have a greater impact for our veterans. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, Alan, for your leadership. Uh, next up, we had a big event last Friday. Boy, was there are a lot of people at the Monona Terrace. We had our 21st Rotary Ethics Symposium. Mike Getzler, the co-chair of the Rotary Ethics Symposium, will come up and give us a quick recap on Friday's amazing event. Come on up. Thank you, President-elect Jason. Love your enthusiasm today. Did you, did you ride in again today? I did. All right, all right. It's cold. My hands are still well, the sun is out, though. It's a beautiful day. Well, as Jason said, uh, the Ethics Symposium was back on Friday. <laughs> COVID dealt us a, a severe blow, but we bounced back, and we bounced back really strongly. So, yeah, 21st um, Symposium was, was on Friday. We hosted uh, 180 students. Uh, we got some great pictures up on the screen, thank you, Jane, uh, from 20 of our 25 Dane County high schools. The opening session was delivered by a very high-energy keynote group from UW, the First Wave Touring Ensemble, and they demonstrated realistic challenges and complexities facing all of our students. The R-O-T-A-R-Y ethical framework for ethical decision-making was introduced during that opening session. And then students attended three separate breakout sessions led by fellow club members here. 
and students were distributed among the, the 10 breakout sessions intentionally in a way so that they were in sessions with other students from other high schools that they did not know. We then reconvened together uh, in a plenary session during lunch and an, an additional 50 uh, Rotarians sat among the group of students afterwards and asked students to share feedback about the event. And that is, uh, for me and many of the other volunteers from our club at this event, the moment of inspiration, if you hadn't already felt it, when we all come back together. We had an open mic and asked students to share their, their thoughts with the full group. Here are just a few of the comments. Uh, and this went on for 25 minutes. These are all direct quotes. I expected to be intimidated, but I wasn't at all. It was great to be able to speak openly. Even though we came from very different schools, we all found common ground and compromise. Even when there were differing opinions, I felt my opinion was still valued. We had respectful discussions even when disagreeing. I had my voice heard. I liked the collectivism and community building discussions. And finally, it helped me find other solutions when working together with other students on difficult issues. Students, high school reps, and Rotarians have been asked to fill out different evaluation forms, which are going to help us, of course, make improvements for next year, as we always do. And our committee will be having a debrief session uh, next month to review those evaluations. Just a few thank yous, and there are many. I have got to say just incredible gratitude to all the folks that made you know, the return of this event so successful. My co-chair on the committee this year was Bob Shoemaker. Bob's sitting over here. Bob, if you just want to wave, wave your hand. <clears throat> and those that have served on this committee know there's a lot of subcommittees involved. I'm just going to say the names of the various subcommittee chairs. They all did a fantastic job. Joyce Bromley, Neil Fauerbach, Andrea Kaminsky, and of course, Bob Shoemaker again. Um, and there were support, there was support across the club um, from many folks that aren't even on the committee. In fact, I think the quickest way to say thank you and so show some recognition is if you participated, volunteered, or supported the Ethics Symposium in any way at any point this year, if you could stand up, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, even though it was the 21st year, we, we talked about this, it was um, really like year one over again because of the two-year, three-year pause due to COVID. So we were starting from scratch in, in a lot of ways, particularly with respect to high school um, outreach and getting them back on, on the Rotary Ethics Symposium uh, bandwagon, so to speak. So uh, we had great success. It's measured in many different ways. I know I shared some of the inspirational comments from the students that attended. Um, but we also had great outreach success immediately after the event, and it's continuing. And I'll just share that. It's a great way to close out. Um, Monona Grove High School uh, responded immediately afterwards, said they'd like to launch an Interact Club. Marshall High School responded immediately after and said, please, Downtown Madison Rotary, help us host our own mini ethics symposium here at our high school. Give us a hand in, in putting that together. Um, there's going to be some Rotary District articles and other um, publication and, and sharing of the success of this event going forward. And finally, one of the most fascinating was I saw an email from um, one of the uh, district, uh, don't think he's the district governor, but from, from District 2451. That's Cairo, Egypt. So it got the attention of the, the ethics committee chair for the district in Cairo. And I know Bob Shoemaker's already exchanging emails about how we might collaborate. So again, great success. Thank you all very much. This is an event that takes lots of hands. So if you're interested in helping out next year, uh, just drop the Rotary office in email. Thank you very much. Let me just, I'm going to make a personal plug here. As president-elect, elect, elect, nominee, <laughs> president, I just want to say the Rotary Ethics Symposium, I've been a member now in this club for seven years. It is, I, I participated three years in, in Ethics Symposium. It is by far the best thing I've done at this club to get to know my fellow Rotarians, to get to know 
He's amazing youth. Yes, the future is very bright. And so if you ever get a chance to participate while you're a Rotarian, I would highly recommend it. And I want to say a huge thank you to Sandy Morales because she was the one that brought me into the Ethics Symposium several years ago. So thank you, Sandy, very much. All right. So we normally go over numbers with Paul, but I'm not going to take his shtick. I'm going to start a new one. And maybe this will happen in seven and a half years when I'm president. It's what am I thankful for? And I'm thankful for all of you in this room. As someone that works every single day on trying to create a vibrant, equitable, and inclusive downtown, you all are doing that every single week. Every time you come downtown to participate in Rotary, and we hope you go across the street and buy something at Wonder State as well, or wherever it is, but you are supporting downtown, and you are adding to the vibrancy of our center city. So it's just a thank you to all of you for making the choice to be members of the Downtown Rotary Club and for supporting downtown. So thank you. All right, the odds are not good on this one, but we only have one birthday today. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible. I feel like there's like 38 when it's my time. I want it to be about me. All right, we have one birthday. Dana Corbett, I think I've seen Dana here. Yeah, right in front of me. Dana Corbett celebrated his birthday on February 6th. Dana, would you please stand? And he just did. So thank you, Dana. You're it. It's all about you, Dana. It's all about you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dana. Happy birthday to you. Man. I got to say, Elaine, is that what my piano playing would have sounded like if I ever would have practiced? Yes. yes. Okay. My mother would say the same thing. All right. We also want to mention Roberta Gathman's belated, excuse me, Roberta Gassman's belated birthday message from last week. Roberta shares, sorry to have missed you on my birthday. I was on my way back from the seventh continent, gorgeous Antarctica at the bottom of the planet. It's truly stunning white wilderness of snow, ice, water, mountains, with only year-round permanent residents being penguins, seals, whales, and birds. We're glad to be on their way back from Ushuaia, Argentina. And it's Ushuaia, thank you, I forget it. Yes, Ushuaia. Uh, thank you, thank you, Greg. I even pronounced your last name wrong, and you helped me out. Uh, the, the world's most southern city in a gateway to Antarctica. It's known as the end of the world, and there's a Rotary Club there. Hardy Rotarians are everywhere. So thank you, Roberta Gassman, very much for your kind words. And there they are with Lester as well. So now it says, please join me in singing happy birthday. But well, we're done with that. All right, members in the news today. The following members were in the news this week. And thank you for all you do to have a dozen members in the news says the accomplishments of this group are mighty. Elaine Carlson, Carlton Jenkins, Jason Fields, Christy Goforth, Anthony Gray, Becky Steinhoff, John Sims, and James Ty. Thank you for all being leaders in the community, and you can read about the news in our upcoming newsletter. All right, on to the program. It is my pleasure to introduce a fantastic presentation here today. We have Mark Vandroth, who became the CEO of, oh no, now I forgot how to say the name, Finkteach? Fincantieri. Thank you very much. Close, <laughs> close, close. Mark, thank you for being here, even if we don't say your name right. Marinette Marine in 2021. Previously, he served as a senior vice president of business development at the Marine Group in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, Mark served as deputy assistant to the president and senior director of defense policy on national security, counsel to the staff at the White House. In his role, he served as the president's senior White House advisor in a broad array of matters, including defense capabilities, irregular and non-traditional warfare, strategic weapons, international security cooperation, military personnel, emerging defense technology, and space security. Mark served in the US Navy, retired from active duty with the rank of captain. He holds a BS in physics from the United States Naval Academy and an MS in applied physics from the Johns Hopkins University. We very much look forward to Mark's presentation and we have made a contribution to the Rotary Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thank you for speaking with us today. I also wanna mention we will have mics for Q&A at the end of the presentation uh, and Mike will stick around, or Mark will stick around after the podium to answer any questions as well. 
It is my pleasure to welcome Mark to downtown Madison Rotary. Thank you very much, Jason, for that, uh, for that kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, to represent uh, Finn Cantieri, uh, specifically Finn Cantieri Marinette Marine. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the company uh, during, uh, during my presentation, but uh, it is always an honor for me. There's, at my facility, 1,500 men and women come in and out of those gates every day uh, with the, uh, the desire to work hard and build ships that uh, defend our nation's freedom and support uh, our country's partners around the world. And they do that with dedication. And it, I am always honored uh, when I get to be the one to represent them in public. So with that, I will talk a little bit about uh, a few different things today, tie it into Wisconsin uh, business, the impact of, uh, of shipbuilding on Wisconsin's business, a little bit about the history of the shipyards that uh, are Fincantier yards here in Wisconsin. Um, and again, at the end, I'd be absolutely pleased to take your questions. And frankly, if in the middle of my talk, I say something and you just have a burning, burning question, you know, feel free to raise your hand. I'll even answer it uh, during the questions. So uh, the mission, vision, and values of the Fincantieri Marine Group uh, are there. I will not read them to you, but we are shipbuilders, uh, and we seek to do that with, uh, with integrity, and we do that in a way that honors and takes care of our most valuable resource, which are the people, uh, the men and women that uh, show up every day in order to, uh, to get ships built. And uh, although my yard is focused on the defense business, uh, we are pleased to be able to build ships across a wide variety of industries, uh, supporting not just our nation's security, but also the Coast Guard, uh, commerce here on the Great Lakes, marine safety, uh, and uh, and uh, now uh, starting in the future, uh, ships that support uh, clean energy initiatives. So a wide wide breadth of uh, of different ship types and customers in the uh, company's larger portfolio. So let me talk a little bit about Fincantieri worldwide. So, so Fincantieri is the largest shipbuilder in the free world, uh, and it should bother you uh, that there are larger shipbuilders in the not free world. Um, but uh, I won't talk, talk about, about them. them. Uh, the, uh, but within the, uh, the free world, the Italian company, Fincantieri, it's at its headquarters, has shipyards in Italy uh, and Romania and Poland and Norway, Brazil, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, Taiwan. Uh, and in the United States, we have facilities here in Wisconsin and down in Florida. So every day, Roughly 100,000 people show up in Fincantier yards around the world, and they do that to create ships that add value. And they do that for ships that will uh, give people pleasure. If uh, Who here has ever been on a cruise? On a cruise. All right. Who here has ever been on a Disney cruise? <laughs> they're not our only customer, but they're a big customer. Chances are if you were on a Disney cruise in the United States, that was a Fincantieri built ship that you were on, so if you had a good time, you're welcome. Uh, the, uh, uh, we build ships for, for the navies of the free world around, around the world, including the United States Navy. Um, we, uh, we build ships, uh, especially in Norway, but now also in North America, that service wind farms and also the oil and gas industry offshore, so we're very much into the energy sector. Uh, again, if there's a ship that's adding quality to life somewhere in the world, Finn Cantieri workers are off building that ship. So the U.S. arm of Finn Cantieri is the Finn Cantieri Marine Group, headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, I've just put there on the map uh, some of the uh, facilities we have. Uh, Texas, that's, uh, there's not actually an industrial facility there. That's a, a naval architecture group that uh, supports the marine and gas industry. But we have repair facilities that support both the Navy and the cruise industry down in Florida. Um, we have a facility in Chesapeake, Virginia that supports uh, the Navy and some also some commercial customers uh, of our engine business, our marine engine business. And then our system of shipyards here in Wisconsin that I'll be talking more about. So in Wisconsin, we have distributed production across three facilities. The facility that I'm privileged to run is in Marinette, Wisconsin. 
Uh, it is as far as you can go in Wisconsin without becoming Michigan. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't know, during years ago, right, there was the joke, Sarah, Sarah Palin. Palin says, I can see Russia from my bedroom, whatever, right? The, I literally can see Michigan from my office, right? It was a, I, mean, I look out, you know, my office is in Wisconsin, but if I look out the window across the river, I'm looking at Menominee, Michigan. Uh, down in Green Bay, uh, we have uh, Ace Marine, which is an aluminum fabrication shop. Uh, it does the aluminum work for the two other yards, Marinette and Sturgeon Bay. If we need piece parts or fabrication of something out of aluminum, we have aluminum specialists there. Uh, also a, a proud tradition there of building aluminum vessels. Uh, we've delivered uh, over 100 medium response boats to the United States Coast Guard, and those aluminum vessels in ports in 30 ports around the country are what save people's lives when their fishing boat goes down, their sailboat flips over. Uh, it's uh, Finn Cantieri built uh, medium response boats that goes out uh, in the, uh, under the uh, command of our brave Coast Guardsmen. Uh, and I guess, I guess Coast Guards, I, I think a woman is also Coast Guardsman I, by, by convention, but the men and women of our Coast Guard uh, who, uh, who provide marine safety. And then in Sturgeon Bay, Sturgeon Bay does a mix of both military work and commercial work. Uh, if you own a Great Lakes hauler, uh, and you're hauling iron ore from, uh, from Duluth on the Iron Range down to Cleveland where it's gonna be smelted. Uh, chances are when the, uh, uh, when the Great Lakes ice over and you can't go anywhere, you pull into Sturgeon Bay and get all your maintenance done for the, uh, for the winter. Uh, and that's also where we're now doing our work uh, to support uh, the barges and ships that we uh, are building there to support uh, clean energy products offshore and clean energy initiatives. So. We move things around. Green Bay is actually our highway. So we move by barge products around those three yards uh, in a way that we can do more efficiently, cheaper, and with less environmental impact than if we had to move the similar type of, uh, of products around via roads. So Green Bay is kind of our little secret logistics weapon. Uh, the only problem is it freezes three months out of the year. But when it's, uh, when it's not frozen, uh, it's, uh, it's great. So, and you can see a little bit about the, uh, the yards there. So Finn Cantieri Marinette Marine, uh, the facility that, uh, that I'm privileged to run. Uh, I was told to speak about history. That's on my topic here. So here is the history part of my talk. Uh, in 1942, uh, a family, family in the area, in the Marine area, Marinette area called the DeRosha family opened a shipyard. And they did so for the specific reason that uh, the United States needed more small boat landing craft in the Pacific to support the war effort. And so the Marinette Marine Corporation was founded and they started building small boats that would then be loaded onto barges. Those barges would go down Lake Michigan to Chicago, across the lock system uh, and the Chicago River and get over to the Mississippi River and then down the Mississippi River uh, through the Gulf Coast, out there, the Gulf of Mexico, out the, uh, the Panama Canal, loaded onto ships and then taken out to the Pacific to support the war effort. Uh, in 1945, after the war ended, uh, Marinette Marine Corporation stayed in business kind of in an unusual way. Most shipyards, and if I flashed back to, uh, to the worldwide yard with, uh, with Finn Cantieri, most shipyards and all modern shipyards have specialties. If you're a shipyard, you tend to do a certain kind of ship. Uh, so, for example, my friends there who have been on our Disney products, are, right, the cruise ships, Molfacone, Italy, which I highly recommend you go to if you're ever in Italy. Uh, not that you're that interested in, uh, um, in, in shipbuilding, but Molfacone is a beautiful city, and it's halfway between Trieste and Venice. So you're right there on the Adriatic, so you're in the, in the resort area. But Molfacone is where we build our cruise ships. In Italy where we build warships for our European partners is on the other side of Italy in Genoa. And you'll never see a cruise ship being built in Genoa or, or a, a, a Corvette or a frigate built in Mofacone. It's different types of work. But in Marinette, they kind of survived by hook or crook. So they would do tugboats, uh, and then they would do some other uh, uh, barge work that, uh, to support uh, the Great Lakes. They really had a renaissance in the 1950s with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway because now you could sell product to customers off the Great Lakes. So they built Staten Island ferries and uh, there's a whole generation of Staten Island ferry that was built. Uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, the training vessels used by Naval Academy midshipmen in their seamanship and navigation courses 
uh, are built, in, were built in Marinette Marine in the 80s. Uh, and uh, actually, that's what I trained on when I was at the Naval Academy was a Marinette Marine product. Uh, we built uh, all the buoy tenders that are currently used by the Coast Guard to take care of aids of navigation all throughout the United States were built in uh, Marinette Marine. Uh, and uh, the University of Alaska, uh, their research icebreakers. So, you know, University of Wisconsin probably doesn't need any icebreakers being in landlocked Madison. But, uh, but if you're the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, uh, you're... Uh, you, uh, you need to have your own icebreaker in order to do uh, the, uh, your oceanography courses that they offer there and the research that they're funded to do. Uh, and we, were, we built their icebreakers for them. Uh, so uh, just a, a real kind of smorgasbord. Uh, that ended. So uh, in uh, the DeRocha family eventually sold the shipyard, I believe in the late 60s, early 70s, to the Manitowoc Corporation. Uh, that'll be a familiar name to Wisconsiners here, but Manitowoc is best known for building cranes here in Wisconsin. But Manitowoc owned the yard up until 2009, and in 2009, Finn Cantieri bought the yard from Manitowoc, and then Finn Cantieri did, you know, we at that point established a specialty, and Marinette, we became a warship builder um, uh, at that point. A little, little bit about, about our uh, facilities. Uh, you can see a nice picture there of, uh, of the shipyard. Uh, and we're building uh, new stuff uh, in order to uh, service new customers. So uh, you'll see in green, those buildings are already built. If you came up to Marinette, you would see them there today. There's uh, the what we call the Frigate Erection Bay. Uh, that building is 500 feet long by about 200 feet wide by about, I want to say 130. I know I'm having to convert because I know them in metric, right? Uh, so I could do it in meters off the top of my head, but I'm converting for, uh, for an American crowd here. Uh, about 135 feet tall. I can assemble an entire uh, soon-to-be Constellation class frigate that I'll talk about later, two of them inside, everything except the mast, mast and the, the mast. mast you put on after you roll it out of the, uh, the building. Uh, so uh, that way, uh, because I'm sure you know that it gets cold in Wisconsin, uh, tomorrow we're going to have a little snow, uh, and we're still going to keep building ships. We don't shut down for anything. There's no weather phenomenon that shuts that shipyard down. Uh, you can see all those buildings are big enough that you can build ships or significant section of ships inside uh, in a heated climate-controlled environment uh, so that we run the whole year round. So um, the, uh, the other green building you see there is a new automated panel line. So if you think of a shipyard, do I have anyone here who's like a systems engineer, right, or took systems engineering in, in college? Shipyards are a system by which you turn pieces of steel into things that float and accomplish a purpose that the customer wants a floating thing for. Uh, if that's the Navy, the floating thing is supposed to go conduct warfare. Uh, if you're a cruise ship operator, the floating thing is supposed to contain hotel rooms and restaurants and dance floors and theaters such that people will pay money to go there to have a good time. Uh, if, you're, uh, you know, if you're looking for a cargo ship, the floating thing is supposed to take something that's valuable from point A to point B so that it can get to market, right? The, everything that we build that floats has a purpose. But you start, in any case, by taking steel and turning it into something that floats. That first step, the panel line, is where you take raw plates of steel and turn it into pieces of ship, either by bending it, welding it, cutting it, welding things onto it, stiffening it. Uh, that, up until last year, uh, was the work of maybe two dozen at any one time welders. And now with this new panel line, it's two operators, a welder, and a whole bunch of robots. Uh, and it's amazing to see the efficiency. Uh, and I haven't laid anyone off because I need more welders in other parts of the yard. I just put people to, to better work. But uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see that uh, new machinery that we put in as, uh, as it's going on. Uh, what you see there in yellow is under production. Uh, so those are pieces of facility now. Uh, the uh, the plant pet, uh, blast and paint booth, uh, which will be new. Um, we blast, right now, we blast our steel and then paint it. Uh, in the most environmentally friendly way in the world. I am very convinced of that. So uh, we blast only with steel shot. The steel shot is recycled and reused, and when it can't be blasted anymore, instead of hazardous waste, because we never let the blast get contaminated with the paint, it can be recycled as recyclable metal. 
Uh, and then the containment we have is world class, so at no point is any paint released into the, you know, aerosol paint released into the atmosphere. We have a, that state-of-the-art blast and paint facility is right there. It's the building at the center of the yard. The problem is that building is too small for some of the pieces of the new frigate that's going to require blast and paint. So we're building a taller, higher building to give ourselves additional blast and paint capability. And it will also have world-class environmental compliance. And then on the waterfront, right now, if, for, has anyone here ever seen the video or who here has ever been to see a ship launched in Marinette, see a ship go in the water? Right, spectacular, isn't it? Right, it's incredible. Yeah, we don't ever want to do that again. That's awful. <laughs> Side launching a ship is spectacular to look at, and it's the traditional way of doing it, and it's unsafe and expensive, which are two things I hate to be part of. It's something that's unsafe and expensive. So uh, we are building, uh, it will be the largest synchro lift uh, in the uh, Western Hemisphere when we're done this summer. Uh, so it'll be a 10,000 ton transfer platform uh, on a series of wenches. We'll be able to roll the ship onto the transfer platform and then just lower it into the water nice and slow and safe and boring and economically efficient uh, and not spectacular at all. Uh, so it will make the ceremonies somewhat less interesting than we have because there's always a big party when you put the ship in the water for the first time. Uh, and, and there is something special about putting a, a ship in the in the water for the first time. Uh, it is, you know, you, you get the, uh, uh, you really understand why sailors have always called ships with a personal pronoun, the female personal pronoun referring to their ships as she, that we never call a ship an it. When it's being built on land, it's very much an it. Uh, but once it's floating there in the water on its own, it, it takes on a characteristic of you, you've created something that in some sense is alive. Uh, so, uh, so when we put them in the water, but we're going to do that now very gently, very slowly. It's, it's spectacular when it happens on a side launch and it's quick and there's a big splash and all that, uh, but that's no way to run a railroad in the 21st century. So once we finish the synchro lift, we will truly have a modern 21st century yard there in, uh, in Marinette, Wisconsin. Uh, and then a little bit more about the, uh, the synchro lift, like I said, large, I said, it'll actually be the largest of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I've been to... Uh, the other one that's this size, which is in Adelaide, Australia. Um, and uh, the Australian Navy uses it for their air warfare destroyer. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, there are smaller ones. The Coast Guard has one about half the size of this in Baltimore. Um, and you can see that's what it'll look like when it's done. You'll have that, that U-shape pier with the ship sitting on the transfer path there with the winches. And the winches will just lower the transfer platform down into the water and the ship will float off. We spent all last summer blasting, blasting, blasting away at the bottom to create the, uh, the depth that we needed to do that. And then this year, we've been building that pier structure that you, uh, that you see. Uh, the transfer platform was made over in Europe. It actually just arrived in Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and once we finish with the, uh, the concrete uh, on the pier there and putting the winches in, we'll connect up the transfer platform. And this summer, we will have ourselves a synchro lift. So what are we building right now over in, uh, in, uh, in Marinette, uh, along with our partners, uh, our par other partner sure, sure. here in Wisconsin? Uh, the littoral combat ship, the Freedom Class, 16 ships ordered by the United States Navy. We've now delivered them 13, and the other three are in final stages of construction. Two of them are in the, in water. the water, getting ready for their uh, sea trials. One goes in the water. It'll be the last thing we put in the water uh, via side launch here in April. Uh, and then uh, once it delivers in 2024, will be done with that product line. Uh, we currently have a contract, a somewhat convoluted contract. Our contract is actually with Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin's contract is with the Navy, and then the Navy's contract is with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is buying four, we'll call them modified littoral combat ships. I would say they're heavily modified littoral combat ships. A lot of them looks, looks very new, in some cases very different as we're building them, but roughly the same size, 3,500 tons, what most navies would call a Corvette. Um, and uh, we're building that now. That's actually probably most of the work in the yard right now are those four ships. Uh, and between now and 2027, we'll deliver those four ships uh, through the Navy to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, as, uh, as one of our regional partners over there. And then the new contract we just started uh, and why all those new facilities and why we are, and I'll talk about why we are hiring, hiring, hiring. The Constellation class frigate, we have contracts for three with uh, uh, options for seven more. And the Navy has said that they might need 20 or 30 of these eventually. 
this is twice the size of anything the yards built before. That's a 7,000 ton frigate. Uh, that is a very, very capable ship. I'll talk a little bit about more. We started building it uh, in the fall with uh, delivering the first one in, uh, in 2026. Um, so uh, again, a, uh, a huge project in front of us uh, to deliver these ships uh, to our Navy customer. A little bit more about the Constellation. Nice artist's conception there. So a little bit about frigates. What do I mean by a frigate? Uh, again, this is the second history part. Frigates were the very first ship that the United States Navy ever built. And if you ever like history, even if you don't like, you're not a maritime guy like me, but uh, a writer by the name of Ian Toll wrote a book called Six Frigates. Uh, and it told the story of Joshua Humphreys and the very first six ships that the United States Navy built, built. One, of one of which is still with us today, the Constitution in Boston Harbor. But it was the Constitution and the other five ships. Some of them uh, met glorious endings. Uh, others met very bad endings of the six ships. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, history. Uh, and when you read it, um, uh, Joshua Humphreys had all the same problems in the 1790s that I have today. He had problems with material and supply chain and labor. Uh, he had a Congress that all had different ideas of what the Navy should do and what kind of ships they should have. Uh, he had, uh, um, you know, uh, he was trying to push the edge of the technology of the day while at the same time building something that the young nation could afford. So I, 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 I urge you to, uh, to if, you, if you like a good history read, Ian Toll, book is Six Frigates. Uh, but those names, we obviously we won't build a constitution because uh, that name never gets reused. Uh, but the, the Navy is starting to name the ships that we're building, Constellation, Congress, Chesapeake. I, I believe the next one will either be President or the United States, which were the other two. But we're going to be naming the, uh, the ships uh, as a throwback because this is you know, the, our modern uh, taking up the torch that, uh, that Joshua Humphreys started the U.S. Navy with uh, back in the 1790s. Uh, and just like the original uh, uh, frigates were for their day, uh, small, multi-purpose, lethal, designed to go a lot of different places and, and do a lot of different missions. The Constellation is similarly smaller, lethal, designed to do uh, a lot of different missions uh, in a lot of different places. So the Constellation, what you see there is in white, the Constellation behind it in blue is the Italian Baragoni class, what's usually called a FREM. Uh, and the FREM, is that, that comes from a French acronym, so don't ask me what it stands for. But it's a, a, an Italian-French design that's used by several European and now some other partner navies. Uh, our constellation is based, it's a redesigned version of the Italian uh, frigate. And the, the, the use, use of that uh, design, and especially the hull form, reduces risk, allows us to go into, has allowed us to go into production faster. Uh, we did do some things uh, to it that were uh, uniquely American. Uh, we lengthened it to put in the American missile launcher. Uh, we changed some of the build specifications to give it the American uh, standards of uh, uh, battle resiliency and damage resistance. Um, and uh, again, you can see, uh, you know, 7,000 tons, and again, a, a, a little description there of, uh, of the ship. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the work that we've got set out in front of us. And that work has a tremendous economic impact on Wisconsin. Uh, now, we buy, we have supply chains throughout the entire United States and in some limited cases throughout the world, but we do quite a bit of our business uh, here in uh, Wisconsin and in neighboring states. Um, the, uh, uh, since Finn Cantieri bought the yards, the three yards uh, that I talked about, the one in Sturgeon Bay, the one in Green Bay, mine in Marinette, uh, they've invested over half a billion dollars in capital improvement since um, And we're up to, uh, that's an old number, we're now up to well over $2 billion across that time of payroll paid out to employees uh, here within the state. Uh, and the number of indirect jobs. So if you think about, I've got a shipyard in Marinette. So obvious, there's some of those indirect jobs are obvious. So I have to buy piping from somewhere to install that piping. So I'm buying piping from a pipe shop. Um, I have to install, you know, um, 
you know, the electrical panels, electrical distribution panels that go on the ship, those come from a from a, a shop here down in, over in Milwaukee. I'm in Madison. I'm not in Milwaukee. Last time I gave this talk, I said here in Milwaukee, uh, right over in Milwaukee. So uh, those are more direct. But if you think, think about, about it, uh, people like to come see ships. We have things like christenings, and we have other events, and the Navy comes up for meetings, which means it keeps hotels and restaurants and gas stations full in the towns where we're building ships and in the surrounding towns. Uh, so there's uh, uh, the employees that we have have to go shopping and they have to send their kids to school and they have to have places to live. So when you have an employment base of what will become here in the next few years, will be at about across all three facilities, over 3,000 well-paying jobs. Those 3,000 jobs create a lot more jobs within the, uh, within the community. And this is who we're out hiring. And like I said, I'm going from building 3,500 ton ships to 7,000 ton ships. So I need, you know, you're going to need a bigger boat, like they said in Jaws. I need a bigger workforce. Uh, last year, uh, I started the year with 900 blue collar workers uh, in the yard, and I ended the year with 1,100 blue collar workers in the yard. Uh, and if I do my job right and my HR folks do their job right, uh, sometime next year, I'm going to have 30, 1,300 blue collar workers in the job. And, and add to that uh, about another six to 650 uh, white collar workers, and that's just in Marinette. And we're also growing in Sturgeon Bay, and we're growing in Green Bay as well, too. Uh, and you know, we need both those blue and white collar um, across all of the skill sets that you see, because those are the skill sets it takes to, uh, in one way or another, to uh, to build a ship. Uh, if you know a young man or a young woman who wants to work with their hands, right? The state of Wisconsin will pay for their training to become a welder in Sturgeon Bay or in Marinette. You know, that they, you don't, you, they don't have to pay to go to college. They don't have to pay to go. And once they're fully trained, within uh, three years, if they're a fully trained welder, uh, they will make more money in my yard welding than an assistant district attorney who's had eight years of law school working down the street at the DA's office. I know this because the district attorney told me that. She was having trouble recruiting lawyers. And I said, how much do you pay? And she told me, it's like, I pay my master welders more than that. Uh, it's like, yes, and they have to go to law school. Right? No law school debt, right? No, you know, and you can be making more than, than you know, than the district, than the assistant district attorney, at least, uh, if you're welding for me. You can do that at, you know, about the age of 22 uh, if, uh, if you come out of high school and go into my welding training program. So, uh, and that's true over in Sturgeon Bay and, and down in Green Bay, too. So, fincantarymarinegroup.com uh, dot and click on careers. <laughs> For, if not for this group, but if you know folks. For, uh, for engineers, folks who do uh, uh, engineers, uh, accountants, uh, all the different business trades, supply chain, also always looking for, uh, for talent in, in those areas as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope that uh, interests you, and I'm uh, happy to take your question about uh, Fink Terry or really about uh, uh, anything else. Thanks. Yes, sir. Could, could you talk about your design process? Does the, does the Navy come to you with an idea and then your engineers work with the Navy? Or how does e that start? Excellent. So the, the, the Navy in general tries, has tried a lot of different approaches for that over time. So let me talk about what we've done with the Constellation design. So you get three different, three different phases of a ship design in general. If, you know, I'm now going to give you, you know, NAVARC 101 here in about 45 seconds. Concept, functional, and then detailed design. So concept is, what's it going to look like? What's it going to do? It's a concept. Then you go to functional. How am I going to do everything that the ship needs to do, and what's your way of actually getting that done? So a concept design is, I need the ship to go 28 knots. Functional design is, okay, I've modeled the hull. I know I need this much power. And in order to have that much power, I'm going to use these engines. I'm going to use this kind of engine here and this kind of engine there. And here's where my shafts are. And here's my propeller design. This will functionally be able to go the speed I thought it was going to go. Then you need to do detailed design, which means you actually have to put it into a 3D model that you can extract drawings from to actually say, OK, here's the foundation. When the crane comes with the engine, I'm going to lay it here. I'm going to put the bolt holes here. And I can give a worker the actual directions. Take this tool, measure out to this point, drill out the bolt hole right here so that we can attach the engine, right? And that's the detailed design. 
historically, Navy would do concept, Navy would do functional, and then they would hand it over to a shipyard to do detailed. What Constellation did was industry pitched different concepts to the Navy. The Navy commented back on it, then came up with a, after they had heard all of injuries, industry's pitches, they said, okay, here's our final concept. When we won the contract, we did the functional, but each of the functional designs, the Navy had approval authority over. Um, that was an interesting and is an interesting process. Uh, if I think they should approve something that maybe they don't want to approve. That's, and then industry does the detailed design. And in fact, if I were to have someone else build this ship outside of other than Marinette, they'd have to redo the detailed design because the detailed design is specific to the industrial capability of the shipyard. So, for example, I have cranes inside that building that can lift pieces of ship up to 300 tons. If I had a bigger crane, let's say I could lift 600, I might build the ship differently. If I had smaller cranes, I would also build the ship differently. So my detailed design is, but the functional design would be the same no matter what because that's the, the, the function of the ship. So uh, we have finished concept, we have finished functional, we are about halfway through the detailed design and building out the ship parts where the detailed design is done with the idea that you, you know, as you finish detail on that first ship, you kind of build behind it. But that's the, the basic design process for a ship. Hope that answered your question. Yes, Thank sir. you very much for your talk. Is it the case that the United States Navy um, uh, capability is, is generally shrinking on balance and that our ability to, to project um, American power, particularly in the Pacific, is, is reduced in recent decades? So the United States Navy is my customer, so I try not to, <laughs> to make a public critique of my customer. Um, so... I will say that uh, uh, the Navy has certainly got fewer ships than, say, when I was, I mean, I joined the Navy in the 1980s. There were more ships back then. There are fewer now. Um, I think everyone realizes that the, uh, that the PLAN, the, the Navy of the Chinese Communist Party, is, has grown and is growing, um, and, uh, um, and that that represents a, a major strategic challenge to, uh, to the United States. Uh, as far as capability, you can do a lot of different capability with a lot of different kinds of ships. Uh, I'm not gonna publicly opine as to whether our capability is greater than or less than, because again, uh, I think that's for my customer to do. Uh, my job is to build the ships the customer contracts for. Uh, I'm glad that the Navy believes that the Constellation is gonna be a good fit for their needs in the future, uh, and it's our job to, to build that for, uh, for my customer, so. Thank you. Um, I'm, I grew up on the Great Lakes watching the freighters going in and out. That was our entertainment in northern Michigan, so <laughs> I appreciate your talk. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and knew Gerald Ford, and know that they commissioned, the, the Navy commissioned some ships under his name. Yes. Were you involved in any of those? Not even a little bit. But I have friends, so I'm not, so what I will say is the Gerald Ford uh, is our newest aircraft carrier. Uh, it uh, just finished up its first deployment. It was commissioned back in 2018, if I remember correctly, uh, and just finished up its, uh, the, uh, the folks who were in charge of her building uh, are very dear and longstanding friends of mine, um, but I had no direct involvement, therefore I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel uh, qualified to comment in any detail, but the Gerald Ford is in commission and just finished her first deployment and I certainly wish her well. It was built by uh, one of our uh, competitor shipyards, uh, Newport News uh, Shipbuilding uh, in Newport News, Virginia. So, Mark Vanup, the CEO of Fincantieri. It was better, I think. Somewhat better. We are so thankful for you being here and so thankful for what you do for the state of Wisconsin, for our United States military and Navy as well. Uh, and I gotta say, as someone that vacations every single year at Mackinac Island to drive by Marinette, 
drive by their facility. It really is world class to have this. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Hope you can join us next week when we hear from Patrick O'Connell. We'll talk about Shine, a company that manufactures medical isotopes. Patrick will uh, talk to us about the scalable path toward curing cancer. Hope you can join us next week. We are adjourned.